Hi there, everyone. Welcome to the Operators Podcast. This is episode 68. And today, this is a two part series. This is the second of two where we're talking with Taylor Holiday. He's going to be diving into a data set that shows what's going on in e commerce. Taylor has unique access to basically the largest data set that exists. And we're going to kind of dispel some of the fact and fiction behind perception around e commerce. So, Let's go ahead and dive in. Thanks again to our sponsors for today's episode, Postscript, Fulfill, and Northbeam. All right, we've talked about why I use Fulfill as my ERP. So the, the number one name in ERPs is NetSuite. To use NetSuite, it costs at least $100,000 a year. Like, honestly, a, a normal NetSuite content contract is like three hundred to $500,000 per year. Plus, you have to pay a third-party consultant, and it's always breaking or whatever, right? That's because NetSuite is owned by Oracle or Salesforce or whatever, and like, it is the only way the company makes money, and it is a bloated piece of malware that it has to support millions of people and millions of salaries and whatever, right? It, it's just, it's old technology from the 90s. Fulfill is modern, bootstrapped ERP built for today. So e-commerce first, Shopify first, you know, that's the real, I, before they were a sponsor, I've, they've been my ERP for like four years at this point. And it's because they're the only modern option available at a reasonable price point, And they're thinking about the future, right? I mean, they haven't raised billions of dollars, right? I think they did one seed round one time. So they're a bootstrap SaaS company. The reason why that's important is, I don't know if you've ever invested a lot of money into a SaaS tool just for them to go bankrupt, right? Or the news right now is that AMP just got bought by MailChimp. And you have to stop using AMP. And <laughs> they just became the, the gold standard of, of, of email pop-up. And now you can't use them anymore. That's what happens with VC-backed companies. Fulfill is here for the long term. They're thinking about the long-term vision of this. And that's why I've used them for four plus years and I'm going to stick with them. Not only because it's a massive pain in the ass to change your ERP. So like I'm very incentivized to never leave, but it's because they're delivering good service at a good value with a long-term mentality. So what does that mean? They're shipping features that have the biggest impact, not features that, you know, will help them land the next client that they need to be you know, profitable. They're trying to make us happy so that we invest more and stay longer into this program. Investors aren't the customers. The customers are the customers. Kind of like Ridge, our customers are our customers. So that's why I love Fulfill. That's why I'm using Fulfill. They're investing in customer support, making sure the product is usable and staying at the top of the, the e-commerce industry. If you need an ERP and you cannot afford or will not pay for NetSuite, Fulfill is my option of choice. Thank you so much. So why why are you friends with thirty year olds? Because <laughs> my <laughs> wife is was twenty nine when I met her, when I was forty eight. So yeah, oh, keeps okay. me young, man. And anyway, this industry is full of kids. I mean, I just Moy's tweeted Moy's just turned forty. I mean, are you kidding me? He's only forty. Yeah, dude, that's that's crazy. He's only has ten years on me. That guy's accomplished so much. He's already <laughs> been on and and fallen off the best podcast on earth. I know it's a, it's a I, um, it's a testament to the power of the the operator network that um, Moyes just threw his hands up in the air and uh, and said limited supply can't compete. I'm out, dude. So uh, maybe this goes to the episode. Maybe it doesn't. But but our producer is pitching Taylor on another operator spinoff. And dude, we are <laughs> multiplying. It's crazy what we're accomplishing. Uh, we should do an Amazon one too. I think that one would get a lot of play. Yeah, it's a good platform. I like the idea. So I think it's a smart move. Meanwhile, Mike is running for governor of Oklahoma, so he's busy. Yeah, I've got to fit this in between, uh, you know, campaign fundraisers. So. I'm pretty My sure that Mike's consulting on the Oklahoma City Thunder's off-season uh, program here for player recruitments. Because every time Listen, I, when I get on a call, the first thing he jumps into is the trades that hadn't been publicly announced yet <laughs> that he was somehow privy to. It's funny, man. The front office guys there are probably sick of hearing from me because <laughs> I'm like blowing them up. I'm like, dude, you crushed it, A plus, you know, and like. 
on uh, this weekend, I listened to uh, Derek Thompson did a podcast about the NBA and their new TV deal and all the ins and outs of it. And I'm blowing them up. I'm, I'm traveling on Sunday, so I'm blowing them up with all my thoughts on the, the new TV deal. And they're probably like, this guy. Uh, <laughs> but when you're the client, they're, they're probably more uh, graceful about that kind of stuff. When are, uh, Taylor, when are you to come and sit courtside with me for a game? We've talked about it. Next Probably. time uh, the Lakers are in town. Exactly. Exactly. I'm booking that now. I've always been, I've been looking for a good excuse to get out to Oklahoma. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there it's a long list. <laughs> yeah. 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 What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Operators Podcast. We have Taylor Holiday from Twitter fame, CTC fame, uh, the most boombastic voice in all of ecom. And we're going to tell you if Q2 was good or bad, or the first half of the year was good or bad, and if it is bad, if it's your fault or not. So, Taylor, I want to say one thing about Taylor. First of all, Taylor, thanks for joining the pod. Taylor is ubiquitous, so I'm not surprised that he's here. However, I will say there are a number of ubiquitous people in D2C, and Taylor is one of, in my opinion, the few who are constantly adding value to the community, so I'm very happy, Taylor. Taylor, some people are big hat, no cattle, and Taylor <laughs> brings the herd. So, Taylor, thanks for coming on. How, how big would you say Taylor's hat is, though, Jason? <laughs> I don't know. He likes a Yankees cap, apparently. I've seen some posts about that. but No, I, I'll just chime in and say we're excited to have you, Taylor, because uh, for all of the just BS that you see online and Twitter, people talking that really don't have a clue, I love that you're always coming with actual numbers like CTC. You, you've you gotten to see behind the curtain on so many different businesses. And so you're really uh, one of the most informed people in the world about what's going on in the space that, that we all play in. So we're excited to have you in here, you know, some of the learnings and some of what you've seen over the, the last few months. Okay, if we're just glazing up Taylor, I'm going to glaze him up a little bit. Uh, Your job is to tear him down, Sean. We're supposed <laughs> to be, it's a good cop, bad cop thing. No, but uh, I brought up this point a lot, is that like the the industry is full of a lot of voices, but inconsistent voices. People typically only like to chirp up when they're winning. And you'll have like these flare ups of like, somebody's really hot, they'll be really hot for three months, they'll be talking all the fucking time, and then they'll fall off because their business fell off or whatever, right? things get hard twitter twitter ecom becomes like less important and that's happened a million times there's a million people you can think of who come in and out taylor's love of the game is so intense that it doesn't matter what's happening in his life he finds four hours a day to fight with people on the internet about big caps versus asc so that alone uh puts him at a table with the operators just the consistency of of passion for this so what we're going to do is there has been a lot of conversation this year about if it's good or bad for e-com. Like, is it a good year or a bad year? And there's tons of stories of people killing it because that's what gets bragged about the most. But what's unique about this year is there's more conversation than ever about things being bad. Like in the past three years, it'd be very rare for someone to like make a post about like, uh, accounts being down, like businesses being down, revenue being down, like people just would hide those things. But I just see more and more of them. I think sentiment has turned negative, at least in an operator space, right? I think consumer sentiment is probably positive. But every time that gets brought up, Taylor's like, what's your fucking data? Because Taylor goes back to his, his resources and he pulls whatever data he can. And he's going to share that today. So we're going to go over what the actual data looks like for the first half. So we have a couple clarifying statements, have a couple questions, but I'm just going to start presenting it. Taylor, do you have anything you want to add to that? Do you want to defend all the Jeez. glazing? No, that, that was a lot. Taylor, who the <laughs> are you? That's awesome. Uh, I'm Taylor Holiday. I'm the co-founder CEO of Common Thread Collective. We're an e-commerce growth agency that helps brands produce predictable, profitable growth. We've been at this for over a decade now doing that. We also own and operate a skincare brand called Bamboo Earth. So we get to play the game in a couple of different ways. Um, and today I'm actually here representing a data conglomerate called the D2C Index, which is a group of partners that represent over 7,000 stores, about $12 billion in revenue, over $2 billion in media spend to provide context to what I think is the important question we're going to tackle today, which is how is e-commerce doing generally or from a macro standpoint? So excited to share with you all. I'd say the, the other thing I'll say is that my second job is like, uh, I think I'm the booker for this show because you guys have been parading all my former employees through this show too. So 
uh, I appreciate the, uh, the the consistent outreach. You're either hiring them or bringing them on the pod. So I appreciate the, the general PR. There is no sure better. That means I think you're, you need to work on your employee retention practices, CTC. <laughs> There's no better talent pipeline of like unique, great voices in the space than coming out of CTC. So if you want to work with them before they get famous, you could hire Taylor at Common Third Collective and right. you'll, you'll sign an agreement that you can't steal them. So, yeah, okay, so hey, before we do the data more. set, why is that, Taylor? Why have you had such a track record of being able to hire really talented people? Because that's something people talk about a lot. It's like, how do I find talent, talented people? You definitely have a track record of doing that. How have you done it? Yeah, I think we have um, a culture of high performance and energy that is attractive to a certain kind of person. Now, the trade-off tends to be that they're hyper ambitious, which is also a hard constraint to keep within uh, an organization. And I've learned a lot about, I would say, the to Jason's critique about what it takes to keep those kinds of people inside of an organization. And we could probably do hours on that idea alone. But the attractiveness about an agency is that there's no, and Sean, I've heard you talk about this on this pod, there's no way to ramp up or sharpen your skills faster than within that context. So when you get people that are really hungry to learn, that want access to tons of information to get a ton of reps really quickly, it, there's no better place. And so we've been very public about that environment and we work really hard to foster it. Um, and so I think it attracts a caliber of person that wants that now. Um, and then you just get tons of network. That's the other thing that happens within an, an agency, right? Is that you get relationship with tons of brands and founders and people, et cetera. So in terms of, we call it a career trampoline, there's really not a better way to progress yourself from a skill standpoint and network standpoint than within a context like CTC. Do you sell it as that? Like almost like an MBA that for most people, you're going to come in, you're going to be here for two, three years, and then you're going to trampoline out to something else? Uh, we used to. I've changed my mind dramatically on this, though. And, and, and why, yeah, tell us about why. Because I actually think that my job is to keep the talented people. It's not to actually help them progress to somewhere else. And I think that that was a thing I said when I didn't have something to offer to keep them inside the organization was that you're always as an organization trying to figure out how to get really smart people to come to your thing. And at the time, that was what I felt like I could offer them was progression. Um, but I think we have something else now. And so we we're much more focused on keeping them inside the org now and uh, less about trying to help them progress to something else. Yeah. And I mean, I worked in agency business and employee turnover per year was like 35%. So like, I don't know what Taylor's numbers are, but it's just the nature of the beast. And if I was 20 and I had to start all over again, Jason, just like your son, the number one thing to do is go get a job at agency business because you will meet more people, you'll learn more things, and it will be like the funnest experience ever. Uh, the other Yeah, we talk about this all the time, like that the best way to learn about how to do something is by doing it and by watching people that are really good doing it. And that there's, there's a whole generation of people that think, oh, if I read enough things on Twitter, if I watch enough YouTube videos, I can get good at something. And that's just not, it's caught more than it's taught. And agencies are a perfect uh, opportunity to just be front row where you get to absorb and, and uh, observe people that are doing the thing. Yeah, dude, an agency is getting punched in the face like once a week. But Jason, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say, you know, I grew up in my career as a lawyer at a law firm and I and I talked to a lot of agency owners and I think about it as a very similar business model. You, you're going to have high attrition. You know, you work for a big law firm, people leave because it's just the path. It's just hard to make it through. Um, and it's an incredible experience. The four years that I made that I did at SCAD and were like, 15 years of career work, but you get that at an agency, but agencies themselves, I'm glad to hear Taylor talk about trying to retain his people because I talked to a bunch of agency owners who are really smart people and have great talent, but you really need to have a plan to bring people up, but you also have to have a plan around just attrition. It's just going to happen. Um, and I think there's a, there's some agency owners that they're just looking to make a buck and there are others who are looking to build something special. And it sounds, you know, it seems like CTC is, is the latter and I'm ready to beat up Taylor on some of this data here. Okay. So the agency to law firm equivalency is fucking dead on. It is, yeah. it is young people first job who have to grind and just do really, really hard work. The difference is law firms typically just have this like older 
group of talent that is like actually doing the client like facing work where the agency it's going to be you so like it is way easier to just like get the shit beat out of you but you don't have like the older adults in the room like maybe maybe you have that but just no nobody's a 20 year agency pro anymore like it's well, just, I'm, I'm, I'm 12. And, uh, I actually think this is a thing that we've done really a big transition has been putting everyone back in the work. So we actually follow that exact model, which is every one of my employees bills client work. And so that's been a big mm -hmm. transformation between this sort of like hierarchic general traditional move to management, become a director, flee the customer as quick as possible. I think that's, uh, the law firm thing is something I've, I've studied and learned a lot from, cause I think you're right. Hell yeah. Jason, I can't believe you did four years there, man. I mean, that means you were making yeah. fucking a, a quarter. It's like dog dollars. years, man. It's like one year is like it actually Paul Graham has a great essay about this, about how certain environments he's talking about startups. But I think this is true about agencies or like you're saying, Jason, law firms that they're like time compression chambers where time, you know, moves differently. And so people will ask me about entrepreneurship sometimes and I'll say, well, like, you know, I've been doing startups basically for 14, 15 years, but you know, that means that like in dog years, that's like a hundred years because it's exactly what you said. It's like the, the density of experiences and learning stress. I don't know. The whole thing is just so different than most environments. And it takes a, like Taylor said, a, a particularly ambitious type of person. And you, you have to have a pretty good coping mechanism, I think for stress and for just all the different things going on, or eventually you're like, okay, I can't, I, I got to take a slower environment. Well, and as, as a deal lawyer, the, the crazy thing is no, no matter what happens, no matter how easy the deal is, every time you sign a deal, you pull an all nighter. And every time you do a closing, you do an all nighter when you're like a junior associate, because there's just so many documents, so many things to do. So I think I averaged like one all nighter per week. And I worked at least six days a week, probably seven for, like four years straight and that's that's why i left so that's why i don't have very little sympathy for people when they complain about how hard they work well did that take it all yeah it's like hair. the the only problem is that you get used to working like that and it's difficult actually then to go back to a normal person kind of pace and schedule in in my experience you well, know it's difficult that, to have like, sympathy for people that are clocking out you know yeah yeah exactly that's, when somebody is like oh man you know uh, th this week was so hard. I think I, you know, I probably stayed to the office till six and you're like, okay, well, like you're, you're probably talking to the wrong person if you're looking for sympathy. Okay. But to, to not feel bad about lawyers, it just came out the top deal lawyers in New York are getting 15 to $30 million a year offers. So these are, these are per year offers like that are fucking like NBA contracts for top deal lawyers. And look, there's only probably a hundred top deal lawyers, but they are, they make a godly amount of money so that that's what you get if you fucking pay it off but they also um routinely sleep on their sofa in their office because their wife doesn't want them coming home at two o'clock in the morning and waking them up that was one of my bosses at the time man so. it's like nfl coaches there's a, a story about one of the harbaugh brothers um he had been pulling these just crazy hours and he uh falls asleep in his car in his driveway and he wakes up, the car's running, he's in his driveway of his house, and he has no idea if he was coming home or leaving. And he calls his brother and he's like, hey, I, I'm so disoriented, I just woke up, I, I don't even remember if I was coming home or leaving. And his brother's like, go in, kiss your wife on the head, and then get back in your car and go to the office, it doesn't matter. <laughs> They're like, well, wow, okay, that's a, that's a different level of dedication. Yeah, dude, that's Elon sleeping on the floor. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Operator's North Beam Ad Unit. So 30 seconds, I'm going to tell you all about how if you have any problems with North Beam, you can directly message Austin, the CEO. He is there. He will set up your ad account. He will make your bet. He'll give you cookies. Really, they have a dedicated team of people, probably 30, 40, 50 reps at this point, who will make sure North Beam is working correctly and functioning so you can get amazing data out of this ecosystem. They will be more hands-on than any meta rep will ever be, and they're gonna help you understand where your ad dollars are best spent, best positioned, and which ads are working. My team works with the North Beam team literally every day. They're in my Slack. Maybe you don't get the same level of uh, support as an operator, but they will be there to make sure it's working. And if you're not happy at all, 
just email Austin. He will take care of you. We use Northbeam every day. It's a benchmarking tool. It's super helpful for forecasting, daily pacing, inter-hour pacing. So we can see like if we just launched an ad in two hours, if it's working or not. That's what Northbeam does for us. So thank you, Northbeam, for the support. I'm customer probably number one. So thank you so much. Well, one thing to add regarding Northbeam, because we just went through a contract renewal with them on their uh, specifically on the MMM. And uh, we got a pretty sweetheart deal, and I expect them to come back to us and raise our price, and they kind of deserve it. it I, I was like, let me let me reach out to the team, you know, and see how it's going, right? Because I'm not in the day to day. That I get I get feedback, and the team was like, they have improved the MMM so much since we started it that they were like, we should definitely pay for this increase. So. And my team hates every agency and most SaaS. The, the only person that hates SaaS, uh, the only more than my team is Sean, Frank. Um, but yeah, I mean, they came to us. They're like, hey, you guys got the, the sweetheart deal. We wanted the first MMM clients. And I, I was very, very pleased when my team was like, it's really working well for us. So that's my little MMM plug. All right. People want to talk about ecom data and, you know, we have like about a hundred thousand listeners, but half of them are audio only. So we're going to be showing data. And if you want to see the data, come to YouTube, watch it there, but we'll also do a newsletter about this. So operators newsletter dropped. It's the talk of the town. Everyone's super fucking excited. So you can sign up to the newsletter. You can go on YouTube or I'll do my best to describe it, but it's on the screen right now. So, all right. Taylor the, news, the, the newsletter written by another former CDC employee. That's that is uh, yeah. it's curated. <laughs> curated, by, yes. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry, curated. sorry. Taylor, uh, dude, I know you're like you're Taylor was joking because it took a long time to actually book him to get him to show up for this. But dude, try doing anything with this group of guys. Like, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I can dude, imagine. we have. We have Aaron sending us fucking daily updates being like, we need 30 words from you for this newsletter. <laughs> I'm like, Aaron, shut the fuck up, dude. I'm trying to do something right now. But I really appreciate the work he's doing. So uh, Taylor, you want me to screen share or I'll do it? You yeah, yeah, that'd it? be great. I'll, I'll do it because I think I can bounce around between these things easier. So I'm going to set up a little bit of what we're going to look at, Sean, because I agree there's nothing worse than podcasting visuals. So um what we want to provide, and you guys hit on this earlier, is that I think as an agency, one of the primary responsibilities we have is context, right? Is that our customers come to us in part because we have a vantage point that they don't have. And this has been sort of an obsession of mine is that we have personally at CTC tried to aggregate as much of our data over time as possible. But the reality is, is that that's still a fairly small sample. And so I've become sort of obsessed with trying to grow my own access to as much information as possible to equip us with the best view of the industry we can. And I think that's what led us to creating the D2C index, which was a group of providers. So this is a culmination of data from Veros, which is the largest publicly available data set that I think exists in the world. I don't know of one that you can get access to for free um, bigger than theirs. I think they have almost 7,000 stores now on there. And then we have no commerce, which provides qualitative data. So they do over a million survey questions a month to the customers that we all serve, asking them all sorts of various questions. So you get this combination of quantitative data, qualitative data that provides you, I think, as good a visibility into this as possible. So Sean, this, this data set that we're going to review came out of something that you've been championing for a while, which is how could we get a view of the same store set year over year? Because what Shopify shares publicly about their growth includes additions of new stores over time. So when you try and surmise the growth rate of our industry from let's say Shopify's GMV growth, the problem is it's not a same store set. And so we are constantly trying to sort out from that the actual expectation of growth of the stores. So what we did um, is we took data out of Veros that is about a 650 Shopify same store set where we had consistent data over a long period of time for multiple years and we wanted to recap the first half in two different ways. One was percentage growth over time. The second was uh, raw dollar growth over time, because that was the other thing that you had sort of brought up as a question. And we're gonna slice that data into a few different categories today, but we're gonna provide views of those two things. So it's about a 650 store sample 
out of Veros. These are all Shopify stores, and this is all online store revenue. So we're not looking at the total business here. We're not looking at retail growth. We're not looking at Amazon growth. This is what is coming out of their Shopify API. Okay, so that's so, the setup. Okay. So I have, I have a couple of qualifying statements there. Yes. So the full data set you said is 7,000 stores and you said yes. $12 billion in GMV. So that represents 5% of Shopify GMV. So I would say that's not insignificant. That is, that no. is a lot of stores. And we've yeah. done the math that like, you know, uh, like a ridge or a hex clad represents like a, a, a thousandth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent. Like, you know, we have pretty good understanding of like a big chunk of the Shopify ecosystem, but 5% is a lot. And then the next thing I was going to say is, but this is a pared down version of 700 That's stores. Right. Do you know what, right. re, do you know what represents how much GMV is there? Amongst these specific subsets of stores? I don't, I can follow up and get you that answer for the newsletter or recap, but I don't know the okay. specific GMV of this sample set. And something that everyone should just keep at the top of mind is how much Shopify is growing, right? Because Taylor holiday is right. That, uh, Shopify doesn't want to report on same store sales because if they start doing that, it you you get too much insight into what's happening in, in, into the e-commerce landscape, and what you'd probably see is is a less rosy number. Their GMV grew twenty three percent in Q one twenty twenty four, right? So that is however many stores they added plus same store sales, whatever. So we'll try to get you guys today, right now, a better insight of. What, what is happening in same store sales? So any other questions from Jason or Mike? Let's roll. Great. Um, okay. So what we're going to be looking at first is what appears to be a bar chart. Okay. That's going to be distributed from least absolute growth to most absolute growth. So the first chart that's going to be on the screen is going to represent that 605 ish stores that I mentioned and how much each of them has grown in the first half of 2024 in comparison to the first half of 2023. Okay. So we are looking at that date range in comparison for raw absolute dollar growth. And Sean, you are right to ask for this. I think because one of the biggest things to understand is that oftentimes, and this is why data is so hard to get to clarity on, is that when we share percentage growth numbers, especially when you share average percentages, it is the most misleading way to look at information because you can grow infinite percentages positively and you can only grow negative 100%. So when you add all of those up and then you average them, it's always going to push the average percentage growth up. So percentages are often really poor ways to analyze this kind of information, but they're the most commonly presented way because it's easy to understand when you consume it but it's really hard to actually dissect what that means. So what we wanted to do was show the entire distribution of the data. So you're not just getting the end output of the, uh, the measure of central tendency here. You are getting each individual end node of the system in a distributed graph that shows you how much each store has grown. So for those not on the visual here, that's what we're looking at. And what you get is, this is for all stores now, we're not distinguishing between size. So this is seven, eight, uh, there's a few nine figure stores in here. And the no. average, uh, go ahead, Sean. I don't, th I don't think we're actually presenting, are we? Are you I don't sharing? see it. I nah, don't see it. So I will you had it up a minute ago, Taylor, but it's gone. Don't worry, dude. I got you. There we go. <laughs> this is the bar chart he's talking about. There we go. Okay. So this is the graph that we mentioned there. So you can see each individual store in the growth, and then you have the average absolute growth and the median absolute growth. Now, when we present data, we always use median. And the reason is, is because I believe well, here's, here's the thing. There's a great saying in statistics that no measure of central tendency is best, mean, median, or mode, but using one is almost certainly worst. And this is a great lesson for you when you think about average order values or anything else. Always try and look at mean, median, and mode when possible. Uh, in this case, mode is not that useful because there's no specifically shared numbers when you get to this level of currency, but we present both the average growth and the median growth. And in all of these cases, what you'll notice is that the average is higher than the median. And what that means, and this is the first sort of insight, is that the data is skewed towards more stores having large tail growth um, in this data set. So the average is pushed up by larger stores that have more success uh, than loss. Now the median, think of that as the middle point in the data set, is closer to neutral in almost every one of these data points that we're gonna look at. And so the 
the median data point is only $27,000 of growth in the first half. That's basically zero, right? When you look at this uh, on the spectrum, the median growth is very small. The average growth is $500,000. And so there is more average growth, but the median point is almost neutral. Okay. And this is what we're going to see repeatedly in this data is that the middle point is very little growth, but the average is representative of more growth. So there are big winners in these data sets that are driving the averages up, but the majority of the experience, the middle point of the data is saying that the growth is fairly small. So that's what we're seeing from an absolute dollar standpoint in this first graph. So Taylor, I mean, before we dive in deeper, before you pulled this data, what was your sentiment on this year after seeing this data? Like, what's your sentiment? So one, I, I, one to 10. I yeah. So I think it's normal. So wherever normal coming into the year, of, if I were to expect e-commerce to be at its standard, let's say it's growing 15 to 18% as a percentage of total retail every year, let's call it the 2018, 2019 era of e-commerce. I'd say that the distribution is about what I would expect in a year without some sort of major volatile event. Okay, so you so you think it's like a milk toast mediocre year. You're like, That's yeah, right. it's going to it's going to be whatever we saw in 2018 or 2019. It's fine. That's what I would call it. Yeah. And so there's obviously this disconnect between sentiment and that reality, Taylor. So what's your theory on why that disconnect exists? So if I were to take this chart um and I were to draw it into quartiles, okay? And I were to say, what percentage of the total distribution of stores is experiencing very little to no growth? It would be the majority of stores. Mm -hmm. The majority of people are experiencing little to no growth. Sentiment is generally an aggregate experience of people. So most people are experiencing little to no, no growth. Some people are experiencing extreme growth. Some people are experiencing extreme loss, but most people are neutral. And so that is not a great experience. We, nobody went into this year likely with the ambition to grow none. <laughs> so <laughs> if most people are missing their expectation, their sentiment is going to reflect that. Yeah. So let's, and that's let's, the normative outcome you're saying. The normative outcome in a regular year is that that's just the reality. 50, 60% of people are negative or flat, or is the distribution that we're seeing here, is it getting more extreme? I guess that's the question. Is, is it becoming no, so more and more a haves and have nots? I think the other th experience we're having is a relative experience to 21 and 22, where this distribution was very different, where growth was norm, right? And I think that it's like if you've lived, if you've been on a really fast roller coaster, <laughs> going on a slow one feels really like that. Like it's not the same experience. And so I think a lot of people experienced a lot of growth over the last few years in a way that was not representative. It's the outlier in the data to me over the last 12 years of doing this. It is not the expectation. Um, and so I think that that is also colors people's experience of the present day is just how much 20 and 21 and even the first half of 22 Really, it's been since the second half of 22 that things have really changed off of that COVID era uh, uh, euphoria, if you will. Right. So let's let's like add clarity and remove gaslighting because I think like on, on the internet, when's it, what ends up happening is there's two groups of people: people that are like th everything is falling apart, and they're like, "No, it's not. You're an idiot." And we actually have the data right here that 10% of people are in disastrous territory. 50 to 60% of people are totally flat year over year. And then maybe it's 10, 20, maybe up to 30% are crushing it or like, you know, actually winning significantly. And those are three very different groups of people, right? If you're in the bottom 10%, you are bankrupt. Like things are very bad right now, right? And if you're 50, 60% of people, no, you're totally right. You're not growing at all. We have the data to show that. And then there's a, a small group of people who could end up being very loud voices talking about how things are going super great, right? So, if you fall into any of those three buckets, those are all three real realities. And it's just that no one, it, this is not actually like a, a one way industry. It's not that everybody wins or everybody loses. It is very product dependent, in market dependent, all the different things that make your business unique. And you can see that on this chart represented in three different cohorts. And, and go down one slide, Sean, because I want to talk to you about how if I wanted to gaslight people, 
how easy it is to do while simultaneously saying truthful things. So as an example, if I look at the average relative growth, and this is the real data point of this same data set we just talked about, I took the average percentage growth of this data set, it's 104%. So if I came out and said publicly, the average e-commerce store is up 104% year over year, that could be simultaneously true and completely a, a distraction or misleading to what is actually happening is because the average gets pushed up by massive percentage growth, especially of smaller stores too, right? And so this data set, if I weight it evenly across every store, is a way to make up data that would be entirely misleading of what's actually happening in our industry. So Taylor, this is a great lesson. We've talked about this a few times on the pod, um, but uh, when I took statistics at Columbia Business School, which was a really, actually really great experience, they gave us this book called How to Lie with Statistics. And it's a classic. Everyone should read it. It's a very short book. Even in Twitter, Twitter land, we can handle it from an attention span perspective. But um, it, it's exactly what you're showing. It's like you can pick and choose data in any way to make an argument. Um, and that's why I love I loved your point about no measure of central tendency being being the right one and, and you want to have all of them. And that's the first thing I was seeing when when Sean distributed these materials is like, in the case of this data, it's very clear that the median is really worth the only thing we're looking at. And and the the average or mean is just it just shows you, yeah, some people are crushing it and it's use it up. And that's always gonna happen. If you look at the S P five hundred this year, the stock market is up because of NVIDIA. You know, and so it's st st statistics are incredibly complicated and can be used to, to mislead. So you kind of have to call BS on every statistic you see until proven otherwise. Well, dude, more, more information is the only cure for misinformation. If you went on and you said on the internet, like, hey, the average source of 104%, what you would say is, why is Shopify only up 23% then in GMV and they're adding stores, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, we just have to give people more context to these. And I do think that it is good to look at, I mean, th thank you for repairing percentages and real dollars, because if I go back to well, the slide, go ahead, Mike. I, well, I just want to make a point that it, another way that context matters is revenue out of the context of cost is not actually a helpful metric. So you could easily say, you know what, guys, we were running at a two ROAS last year, and what are we doing? We're not generating any contribution margin. We're gonna run at a three and a half ROAS, and your revenue might fall, but your contribution profit, your, your financial health might go up. And so we can, the biggest, it's funny, early in the company, we had this kind of joke that the company executives divided into two camps. And I was the president of the top liner camp. And then uh, my CFO was the, the king of the, the bottom liner camp. And the joke was that we kind of fought, fought with each other and we were all about growth and gross sales. And he was all about how do we actually generate profit off that? But it's, it's just an important thing to remember. Anytime you hear any number having to do with revenue, if you don't have the context of cost, then it just doesn't matter. Right, because the cost structure tells you whether or not that revenue increase or decrease was even healthy. Like, I know ways to grow our revenue much more rapidly where we would lose money, but I'm not going to do it. And, uh, like, so that's it's always important to keep that in mind. If you he see somebody else say a revenue number to without the context of their expenses, don't put too much stock in it. Yeah, well, you see revenue today, you see profit. 15 days after a month closes so it's like it, it, it's way easier to brag about the revenue number and be like yeah dude we're fucking crushing it revenue's going up but be like okay what's your profit well give me give me until middle of next month when my accounting team finishes the analysis and then i'll tell you yeah this is like the ultimate internet thing i made seventy thousand dollars in two weeks and then when you dig in it's like they did $69,000 in revenue. And you're like, you didn't make 70,000. Like we'll use that word sometimes. And it's like, no, like that's the start of like the process of trying to make money. Well, the, the other thing I think it's really important, and this actually I think is one of the core drivers of growth rate in our industry is what funds the growth. Um, and if there is excess capital that funds the growth, whether that's venture dollars, easily available debt, growth is going to be easier to accomplish because it's easier to fund. 
when you right. fund growth with your own cash, it is going to suppress growth rates because free cash flow and the ability to create that in e-commerce is incredibly challenging. So I think you could, in many ways, tie the availability of capital to the expectation of growth in our industry because it's just way harder to grow really fast if you're self-funding that growth in our industry. This is also one of the reasons why as a business operator, my, my kind of word of wisdom here is that you run your own race because businesses are like fingerprints. They all have unique characteristics. Even if you're selling a similar product to somebody else, they've got a different capital structure. They've got a different ownership structure and it's just the what's possible with their numbers and your numbers is going to be different. And the goal is to run your business as well as you possibly can. You want to pay attention to things like this to understand how other people are doing. But there have been plenty of times where I knew that the industry was growing slower or faster than us, but I didn't put too much stock in it because that's not relevant really to me. What's relevant to me is within our construct and our constraints, what can I accomplish? I think where you get worried by numbers like this, and the reason to check in on numbers like this is when within the kind of set of limitations and capital and whatever that you have, your performance is underperforming the market really significantly. Like that's when you should be like, hey, why is that? But it's if other people are growing revenue at 30%, you know, I don't know that that's as relevant as saying, hey, the capital that you're investing, are you getting a good return on that, you know, relative to the market? And there's this rule that I call the velocity constraint, which is that the default growth rate of your business is comparable to the rate at which you compound revenue from the customers that you have. So all of you guys, I've always been sort of a fascination to me because none of you compound the value of your existing customers very quickly. <laughs> like your yeah. LTVs in your product categories are not very good. So your velocity constraint, like the default growth rate for all of your businesses should probably be somewhere in the 20 to 50% range because I'm guessing that's where your one-year LTV comes in. But if you are a business where you compound the value of your customer 300% in a year, you guys had Shireen on here, Bobby's an example of that, where you just have these subscription businesses with their, their default growth rate should be much higher. Now, but that's why I think has been so fascinating about what you guys have all done from a marketing standpoint is that you've been able to consistently acquire new customers so efficiently and quickly that you've been able to exceed your default velocity constraint. But that's an important point, Mike, for people. Yeah, yeah so, and it's it's an interesting question, Taylor, to dig in. We don't dig in on this very often, but why? You know, what is the kind of hack or what is the extenuating circumstance that's made that possible with each of our businesses? And I think the answer is a little bit different with each of us. One of ours is that when you can go and add like a physical distribution, say a Walmart or a Target, the economics of that and the way that they play out, you're able to kind of bend the financial laws of the universe in a way that is unique. Um, like as just an example here, usually to fund growth, it's like, I've got to take, like you said, free cash flow. I have to invest that in marketing, pay CPAs that I gradually pay back over time from an LTV. We had a situation where it's like, oh, okay. We start to sign up retailers like target. We go to our manufacturer and say, Hey, we don't have the cash to pay for this. If you'll float us, you know, we'll pay you once they pay us. And our manufacturer basically says, yeah, sure. We want the volume. And all of a sudden uh, you know, you've created kind of capital out of thin air. You didn't take on debt. You didn't have to fund it out of free cash flow. And, uh, you know, I think uh, with with Hexcloud, for example, I think having the, the partnerships that they they've, you know, that they've been able to have and, and Gordon, I think they've had a really abnormal organic customer uh, attraction rate like. Anyway, there's different ones for each of our business, but it is an important thing to say that there's some gravity that just exists based on your financials. And a lot of times people discount that. I was just going to say that in 2019, like Q1 2019, our AOV was like $85 and our LTV from that cohort to this day is like 110. That's a very, very shitty uh, LTV. That's like five years, right? Our AOV of a new customer today is $150. And in the first 30 days, they're giving us more LTV than we got for five years from those earlier cohorts. So, and, just, and yet you're still even in really hard categories, Sean. Like, it's funny. I, I had when I published my 25 spicy takes the other day on 4th of July, one of them was like 
Sean should shut down Ridge and choose an easier business because he's playing the hardest game possible. <laughs> it's like every category you're in is so hard, man, uh, that you because of that. And it's it's impressive. In that yeah, sense. Sean's going like to have so the challenging. biggest shoe company on earth in 20 years because he like cut his teeth doing it really hard. And then he's going to pick some category like makeup and just blow us all away. Oh, dude, I, if, I, Sean, if you think that's bad, our LTV on digital is like $35 or our six month LTV is like $35. So it's like, we're like the extreme of the extreme of the extreme where it's like, you have to just get millions and tens of millions of people to make the numbers work. Yeah, Dude, I, I encourage anybody to try to sell wallets. It's the worst fucking business on earth. I've done people, it. It's terrible. Yeah. 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 And when we started selling rings, we literally had a conversation that was like, this is so easy. And then it's like, we're talking about another one-time purchase, another multi-hundred dollar AOV, and like with no LTV attached. And we thought that was like discovering oil for the first time. All right, guys, but let's keep going. We have Yeah, so, so the next thing we're gonna do is break this into some categories now. So we've looked at the total data set, and now one of the requests all the time is to break it into store size. So the next thing we wanted to look at was the, dis the difference in growth between seven-figure stores and eight-figure stores. So on the seven-figure side, this first slide here, you see that the average absolute growth, so same bar chart showing you each individual data point in the graph. You can see who's growing, who's not. Uh, you can see that the average absolute growth is $256,000. So, uh, Again, seven-figure stores, so somewhere between one and nine point nine million dollars. The at median absolute growth, one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. Right. So again, you can expect that those are fairly small percentages in total. And if you go to the next slide, we break down the average and median growth from a percentage standpoint on slide five here, and the median growth for seven-figure stores was nine percent in the first half. If you are a seven-figure store growing nine percent. That is a challenging freaking environment, right? At that stage of business, you would hope to be experiencing from a percentage standpoint, much more growth than that. And I think this is the section of the market where you do get a lot of the people that are seeking advice, having conversation. And this is a challenging time for that size of business. My experience is that the incumbents, those people who established customer bases ahead of this era and have won the digital real estate the SERP pages, the Amazon listings, there's just a major advantage given the maturity of the present market that it is much harder to enter in and win now than it was uh, many years ago. And so this group is really struggling. So Taylor, I have, I have some questions for you. With this data and all your experience in e-com, what would, what's your advice to a young bootstrapper e-com operator, someone who wants to get in and start a brand? Looking at it right now, what, what would you do? If you don't have leverage at some point in your business that is uniquely creates a unique advantage advantage to you, you are in for one of the hardest business environments you could ever imagine. So if I think about the four, well, like we have this principle we call four quarter accounting. We break uh, e-commerce PL into four categories, right? You have CAC. So let's think about what would create leverage in customer acquisition costs. It's organic audience. This is why influencer brands are working is because they have leverage against customer acquisition costs. They can go out and acquire customers for basically free. If you don't have that, you are in major trouble to try and go win if just throw your hat into the Facebook ring and just get bludgeoned to death in that arena. So if you don't have audience leverage or some customer acquisition cost leverage, you're in trouble. Go follow someone like Kevin Espiritu at Plant Daddy and learn about negative CAC and understand why he's able to win in this environment, okay? Second is sort of uh, margin leverage. So Sean, this is something you have. Like you have really high gross margins that create an opportunity for you to win. If you understand that you can go spend 50, 55% on marketing and you're good at it, you can go on creative advantage if you have margin leverage. We had that at Kalo. We had 95 basis points of margin on our uh, product. It was insane, right? It creates a huge advantage. Or operating leverage. Can you create a business where you can run really lean as an organization and be successful? There's stories like, I don't know how much you guys know, the Jolie guys, they have like three or four full-time employees like that. The rise of sort of this efficient operating system is another point of leverage. The reality is you have to have it somewhere. If you don't have it, you are in this moment in real trouble. I got asked this, would you start an e-commerce? And I said, there's no way I would start a brand today without one clear, unique leverage point and hopefully two in the business because it, it's just way too hard. Yeah. So let's like, you know, the average listener to our show 
probably owns or runs a business that does seven to eight figures. And this is this is like the straight sauce that they should be looking at is that the median store has grown $115,000, which is not a lot of money in the first half of the year. And like we can look that there's there's two outliers on here that are growing five plus million dollars, right? That's that is a store doing five million going to 10 million. That's massive fucking growth, right? But the vast majority of this chart is in this like down to to you know up maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, right? So this is where most people are actually operating right now, the vast majority. So if you listen to this and that's you, that is the reality of the environment right now. And there's definitely 10 to 20 to maybe even 30% that are crushing it up a million dollars on a seven figure store that's huge. But the numbers don't lie. The median year of year growth is 115 grand. And, and that's grinding, right? Like imagine the margin on that $115,000 in revenue is probably zero dollars. Oh, dude, like it's, I, it's just grinding. And people got so mad at me in 2022, 2023 when I said that you would have made more money working at Facebook during the pandemic and right now. Like, dude, the average Facebook employee is pulling in like 300 or 400 grand a year, straight profit, no fucking stress. And they get to like, you know, have awesome free snacks. And we're over here fighting for credit card points. <laughs> like that's that's what the fuck we're that's doing right. as e-com merchants. That's so right. I, well it's also because those organizations are the ones making all the money off e-commerce too. <laughs> so it's like that's where all the dollars are flowing in this totally. space. All right. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So, so is, on the now we're going to eight figure stores. Okay. Um in terms of looking at both average absolute growth and median absolute growth. So average absolute growth for an eight figure store, two point one million dollars median absolute growth about a million dollars okay so in many ways from a percent if you think about the distribution of one to nine million and the distribution of 10 to 99 million nine hundred eighty one thousand dollars is not a lot of money it's in the same vein as what you're seeing on the seven figure store from an absolute dollar standpoint it's a little better but the median year over year absolute growth is about a million bucks on it on an eight figure store but one takeaway here is that there are more winners. The average person is winning more. There are less flat stores. And that goes into that incumbents are winning more. They have the Amazon listings. They have the search pages. Right. They have the dollars already built. If you get to eight figures, you have some sort of operating leverage, right? That's and right. This, is why, this is why multiples go up as your business gets bigger. That's there right. typically is more sustainability, replicability, and that's what the data set's showing, right? Well, there's got to be some survivorship bias to it as well, right? Because you, if you made it this far, you have you already have something special, and therefore you're able to grow. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's kind of the point I'm making, Jason. Is that exact fact? If you get to a certain scale, you have kind of proven the replicability of how you're growing, and so it's it's going to be more surprising when a really big store just kind of drops off the map. Yeah, and I mean. There are there are a, a few very scary drop off the map numbers here. If you're a store and you're down twenty five million dollars year over year, that fucking hurts. And then there's there's equally a couple of winners, but yeah, I I would say I mean the numbers show that like the average store here is is a little bit positive, a little bit growth year over year, but dude, it's still not fucking that. That rosy. If you <laughs> no, we'll go to the next slide because we can compare. We have nine percent median growth in seven-figure stores and fourteen percent median growth in eight-figure stores. So this is, I think, a good a good data point, right? Like to compare those two categories of exactly what we're saying is that the median growth for eight-figure stores is about forty percent higher. Now again, fourteen percent is not a lot, right? Like again, I don't think anybody's annual plan was fourteen percent growth, but. I do think that if you compare seven and eight figure stores that yes, eight figure stores are able to sustain in this environment and grow more effectively than seven figure stores. And again, that just has to do with a lot of that growth is coming out of their existing customer base. It is an increase of the revenue from the customers that they acquired in the previous year that they're driving more of that efficient growth out of their existing customer base than new customer revenue. Totally. All right. I'll give you a specific data point. In the D2C index, one of the things that we look at each month is that new versus returning revenue growth. And for eight figure stores in the month, this, just looking at the month of May, 42% of the revenue growth was coming out of their existing customer base. And the new customer revenue growth was only like 13%. So the total revenue growth for eight and nine figure stores in May was larger. It was 25%. But that the distribution of where that growth is coming from is the existing customer base more than new customer revenue for sure. All right. I want to talk about Postscript for a minute. We switched to Postscript a few months ago 
and the transition was completely seamless. And I have to say, like, the level of commitment they have to their clients is exceptional. They chased us for a really long time. So we're using their SMS platform, and it's gone off without a hiccup. Uh, like I said, they're really committed to us. Um, the pricing was very reasonable. And they are working on some really cool stuff with AI. And I think we should expect an announcement from that pretty soon. So check out Postscript if you knew an SMS. So Taylor, here's the thing that I'm always the most curious about. You see all of the chatter about conventional wisdom. Yep. And you have real in the trenches experience with these brands. You're, you're looking at all these numbers. What is one or two pieces of conventional wisdom that you have found is, is not accurate? So one of them is that what I am personally experiencing is not a good indi indicator of the market <laughs> is that mm -hmm. I, I really have tried to disassociate my personal per perception of my business from the external circumstance and to try and actually go seek out clarity for myself because I have just not found that to be a good predictor of what is happening around me all the time. Um, your business is unique and novel and distinct from the macro environment. There are certainly ways in which it is affected by it, but there are a million reasons why your individual data is just one node in this giant sample here. And so I think that's one of the things that I try and I think I, the reason people find my voice, I think a lot of times on Twitter is to be confrontational is because that's a message that, I'm, that it doesn't feel great all the time to receive that your individual experience should be challenged in a broader sense of what's happening. And to step back and look and go, okay, what is occurring around me versus what is happening to me specifically? They're not always the same thing. That's definitely one of them. Um, and then I think what, what people really want to know is like, okay, how do I use this information relative to my business? And I, I don't actually think that you do. Uh, one of the things that I like to say is that benchmarks are generally useful and specifically useless in the sense that I don't think that this should govern your own expectations of your business. I think there are much better ways to dictate the expectation of your growth. Um, I do think that it's important to understand, but when I see people really reach for this information is a lot of times when they're trying to validate their own struggle or validate their uh, overperformance. And these slides either end up as representation for how much better we are than everybody else or the reason why we're worse or in some case. But I really think you should try and contextualize your own growth relative to yourself more than more than the market. You got to ask why, you know. That's the, this is the what, and then you got to ask why always people just don't ask why enough people are always looking at the what and just trying to grab onto that and, and justify something, but you just got to keep asking why. Yeah. And I think that is the, the, the right next set of questions here. And it's what we try to dive into a little bit deeper in, in the report that we published, but is to try and get to why is this growth this way? Um, why does it look like this? Uh, what is it telling us? What are we learning? And I think so much of this market is really dictated. It is, it is hard to overstate how capital intensive e-commerce is and how challenging it is to grow if you don't have access to capital. <laughs> and I think mm -hmm. that that is a thing that I think, especially for smaller stores, there's just not dollars to plow into excessive, fast, rapid growth right now. There's just no availability for anything other than producing your own profit, which means more conservative advertising targets, which means slower expectation of volume. All of those things contribute to this environment in a way that I think is really important to, to wrap our heads around. Dude, I mean, yeah, Taylor, you have the most experience out of you know most people and you're saying, oh yeah, I would not start an e-commerce brand unless I have like a very clear advantage to win. And I, I've been saying that forever. And it's like, dude, cause it's so fucking hard. Like, like my, Mike, you made, you made the example that, oh yeah, I made $70,000. You might clear negative money on that $70,000. Mm -hmm, for sure. Where if you did anything else, <laughs> you would at least have some money left over, right? Well, that and is... not only that, but a lot of times when people are saying that, what they really are highlighting is that they found a micro inefficiency in the market that's going to be arbitraged out within days or weeks. And that's why it's like, I made $70,000 in two weeks. And it's like, yeah, you're using that time frame because six weeks in, that arbitrage was gone. You know, and I, I think that this is the thing about 
e-com is that there was a period where it was just structurally easy and now it's structurally hard as it's more mature as more of the world is online the number of competitors has only gone up there's there's a lot of reasons why it's difficult i've said this before but i'll just hop on with what you just said what taylor said which is at the beginning you should be thinking about what kind of moats can i build what kind of sustainable competitive advantages can i create and if you can't make a really good argument that you can do that you should not even start because you're just saving yourself months and years of grinding and not creating enterprise value and i've said this before and it's counterintuitive that the absolute worst thing that can happen to you as an operator is to start something that has just enough traction that you keep going but is not promising enough to create enterprise value because you can stay on the hamster wheel you can stay on the treadmill for months or years grinding away only to realize that you're not really building any value and unfortunately e-commerce is uniquely attractive it's kind of the shiny object that can really induce people to do that where they spend so much time trying to build something and then they want to sell it or they want to recognize some of that value and it just it just can't be because the enterprise value isn't there so it, you know we want to be funneling our time and our effort towards something where you're building value that you're going to be able to enjoy and that value is not going to exist if there's not competitive advantages and your competitive advantage cannot be Facebook ads because there is yep. no competitive advantage anymore. Yeah. Well, right? what's like, the moat there? What's the competitive advantage, right? Like if yeah, you're if your competitive advantage is like we've got, you know, a little bit better converting homepage, the market's going to arbitrage that out. If it's I'm, you know, really I, I've I do really good at knowing how to run ASC campaigns on Facebook. Well, great. 6 months from now, ASC might not even be around. They might be all AI on Facebook, you know, like so I, I think you have to like, you have to have more like kind of structural, this is what we're talking about, like structural competitive advantages. And uh, those are harder to come by in e-commerce. Yeah, I think one of the questions that gets asked a lot, so we're looking at this from, and Sean, you hit on this earlier, the distinction between brand sentiment, like our experience and customer sentiment. So I think this is, because the, the easy thing to potentially blame would be to say that, the problem is consumers and their health. And so therefore the purchase volume is down or things are uh, negative. And so one of the things that we've worked, we are now over a year into a really cool project called the direct to consumer confidence index, which is a survey of e-commerce customers delivered by no commerce asking about their perception of the economy. And what's, it's exciting to get to a year over year. So we're about 15 months into this to be able to look and compare again, this qualitative response of people's perception of the economy. And we ask a series of questions, things like, do you plan to spend more now or in the future? What is your perception of the economy today versus in the future? Do you plan to save money or spend like these series of questions? And then we normalize them onto uh, this index. And it was inspired by the Consumer Confidence Index, which goes back to like the 1950s produced by uh, University of Michigan has one. And then uh, the Trade Commission has another that, that are often referenced uh, for a qualitative understanding of how consumers perceive themselves. And so this is cool because it's our industry. And what we've seen is that consumer sentiment has generally been fairly consistent this year. You can see the graph. There was some low points in February. There was a low point in last October. But this year's numbers relative to last year are up a little bit on average. And what's interesting, if you go to the next slide, Sean, is that we have found that the DTCCI correlates almost perfectly to the S&P 500. Um, as well as to the Dow Jones index, um, such that the customer sentiment and the market have a relationship to one another, um, where they affect one another in a way. And we've seen that generally the positivity of those things have led to some positive customer sentiment. Now we could pull spending data. We have lots of cool information on that from the credit card side of things, uh, as well as general GDP growth, inflation. Like there's definitely a ton of components here. And I'm not a macroeconomist, but what, what we do try to provide is an insight into how the customer is perceiving the economy for themselves and specifically our customer as an industry. So just another data point to think about like where is the softness potentially coming from? Yeah, look, and we've seen 
the news play a big part of this. It's like when the the Russia Ukraine war broke out, like it was really really scary for a little bit, and then we started talking about like oh oil prices are going up, and we saw e commerce ROAS decreased rapidly in 2022 because of that, right? And like that's the news got really scary really fast. Uh, so you could definitely see how like yeah like talking about how great the market is could affect this. But dude, this is great data, Jason. Anything anything you want to add to this? Well, I'd like no, I'd like to kind of. I think we should just sum it up because we've been in the weeds a little bit and you know, we're, what are the conclusions that Taylor draws from the data? Like let's summarize. Yeah. I think that I like the simplest data points, the median expectation of growth for eight figure stores is 14% for seven figure stores is around 9%. That's likely lower than what they set out to do. So that leads to a general brand sentiment that feels like it's hard, that feels like it's challenging. There are tails on the distribution of brands that are growing really effectively and those that are experiencing genuinely immense hardship. And when you think about getting together a town square like Twitter, you're going to have all those voices, but most of them, most of the majority of voices are grinding it out and with very small gains and loss. And that I think is really coloring a lot of the experience that we're having as an industry. Love it. What about, uh, what about nine figure brands? I don't think we talked on that. And that is not the name of our podcast. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. Asked, I asked Taylor holiday for that. And, uh, he's just like, there's just, there's so few. <laughs> I mean, in, re in reality, guys, that, that it is a big piece of it is that it is a small set of information that when you try and do measures of central tendency of sample sizes of like eight, uh, I don't know that it's the most useful view of information. Um, but we can we can maybe maybe we tease that and we let you guys use it for the uh, the newsletter this next well, next week. Well, we should maybe Sean, we should do the big dog chat and have a proprietary. Everyone signs an NDA and we pr provide like we have a proprietary data set just on the big dogs. Yeah, we'll do, and it, it shows like like what you're talking about is um is like the way Shopify built their business is that there's a lot of seven figure stores and like we have the data that shows that there's hundreds of them and like they're basically flat. And then there's like a, maybe a couple hundred eight figure stores. And then when you get to nine figure stores, I've made the joke that like, yeah, I can text like half of them. It's like, there's only, yeah. <laughs> there's only <laughs> like the maybe, maybe 50 or a hundred nine figure stores out there. Uh, yeah. And the, the other thing to remember, right, is we're just talking about people's online store revenue. And like, if you think about Mike, like Mike doesn't qualify for the nine figure chat if he has to submit his Shopify numbers, right? Like, totally. so we're, right. So that's, it's really important to understand that the distribution, like I'm standing, we share an office with Skull Candy, like they're not a nine figure e-commerce business, right? Like, so there's a lot of brands that I think when you think about their growth expectation and Jason, I think this is something maybe you brought up in the questions ahead of time. What about for international or retail or the other things? A lot of the growth for brands generally is coming from broadening distribution and region way more than it is growing their dot-com store sales. Like that is not the mechanism by which businesses are growing in this moment. Yeah. And look, people should take this with a grain of salt, right? Every business is unique and there's there's cohorts of people who are absolutely fucking dominating. There's cohorts of people who are going bankrupt and there's 50% of people in between. But you should just have this frame of reference when you look at like the day to day and then you plan the second half because the worst thing that can happen to your business is planning for 50% growth and then getting that nine or getting that 14, right? That's how you end up in situations where you get those death spirals, where you have covenants on your loans, you, you bottle this fucking inventory, you all this money and people want to get paid and you don't have the revenue to support it. So I would, I would caution that the world's pretty okay very, very mediocre, very okay. And you should have that same outlook until something changes over the next six to 12 months. And the thing that will change is interest rates because interest rates coming down will free up more capital, will make everyone feel a little more drunk again. But your best guess when that happens, that's that's when the purse strings will be unloosened. But not in 2025. Yeah, well, I look. Yes. I've been doing a bunch of series on. I think I think there are a, a set of dominoes to keep an eye on. One is successful consumer IPOs. I think are a greasing of the financial markets in a way that I think there are some brands really positioned to do that. And then look, you guys are a part of this too. The reason I think you guys what you're doing is so important is because you are giving visibility to the fact that there are large profitable consumer brands that are worth investing in and they're worth participating in. Now you guys may not need the capital, but I think it's all part of a set of things that need to occur for our industry to reestablish confidence of capital, which is we need to have successful consumer IPOs. We need to show that brands can get large and profitable. And then downstream from that, we need to understand those roadmaps 
mishaps, and that the capital will come back in those cases. But it doesn't help when we have lenders that were borderline predatory going out of business because they had bad risk analysis. It doesn't help when all the previous cohort of consumer IPOs are down 90% from their top. We have some work to do as an industry to reestablish trust and credibility of capital. And so I think that's a part of the important work you guys are doing, and I'm excited for it. Yeah, Thanks, yeah, Taylor. Love that. When you put it like that, uh, things are actually going pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, really, I, th I think we're, we're cleansing ourselves is like what's happening right now of a lot of like over, bad risk analysis and bad allocation of capital into things that didn't have the potential to produce against their expectation. And we have to reset trust and rebuild that. And I think that's what this industry is doing right now. All right. Beautiful. All right, boys. That was awesome. Ta Taylor, you, Taylor, you, I played golf with Shaq. Now it's your turn. We got to tee it up together. That's a good expectation. Now that you've got that bar set, I think that's an easy one for me to clear. So I'll, 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 I'll go get it. No, I love it. All right, boys. Thanks. Good to see you all. All right. That's a wrap on episode 68. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Hope that you found that deep dive on data informative. And want to say one more thanks to our sponsors, Fulfill, Northbeam, and Postscript. Couldn't do this without them. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.